This doesn't worry me at all, mainly because I'm sitting in the front row and I don't have protective eyeglasses. I'm sure, I'm sure I'll, be, I'll be fine. And if I am, I'll be back to, uh, to introduce somebody else in a little while. Can you please put your hands together for, uh, she's a lecturer in the School of Physics and the School of Chemistry in Trinity College, Dublin, Professor Valeria Nicolosi. Thanks very much. Uh, guys, this is brilliant, such an energetic crowd, and uh, you'll see this is going to be very practical. I'm going to show you how you can do physics and chemistry in the kitchen. So that's going to be pretty straightforward. So I'm going to talk about uh, one very special class of nanomaterials. A lot, this word is being used a lot, we hear a lot, we read a lot in the news. Nano, what is nano? Nano, it's small. So think about something that it's one billion times smaller than a meter. This is the, line, the length scale we're actually talking about here. And uh, we don't realize, but in actual fact, we have nanotechnology around us in the everyday life, every minute. We use it, we don't realize. It's there, we buy it. So it's there for, I don't know, lubricants, uh, I don't know if you are like me, I like to buy clothes, which I don't hear, need to iron. I'm really, really bad at that. Um, and those contain, contain nanoparticles, which allow the, the material to be stretched and to be uh, nice and smooth. It's in cosmetics, it's uh, in uh, um, dental um, um, prototypes there, in sports goods, automobiles, electric cars, normal cars, airplanes. Uh, energy storage, batteries, everything you actually use in terms of electronics. Um, a lot of, the, of these things contain nanomaterials. You use them, you don't know. So I'm going to talk about one very special nanomaterial, which was, um, uh, was discovered in 2004. It's very recent. And uh, it's actually coming from, from the oldest, one of the oldest materials known to man. It's actually what we find in the lead, in the pencils, uh, things that we use in the everyday life. So if I pass around this piece of paper and this uh, pencil here, you're going to be science scientist for the night. So what you're going to do there, scraping your pencil on top of a piece of paper, is uh, a wonderful material having wonderful proper properties, because that's what happens when you make materials really, really, really tiny at the nanoscale. Uh, they change properties. We make them uh, wonder materials. And the wonder material that you guys are making right now, we call graphene, and comes from graphite. Graphite if we look at the microscope, it would look like that. A lot of uh, different planes of carbon atoms, and these are arranged into planes. I don't know if you can see it. They are stuck one on top of the other. So here I have two planes of these, uh, uh, of these carbon atoms. Usually, uh, in a pencil, there would be billions and billions and billions of these, uh, uh, of these layers, one on top of the other. So what you're doing there while you are writing with that piece of paper, on that piece of paper, it's literally breaking what we call Van der Waals forces between the layers, and then I created a defect. So <laughs> <laughs> that's what you do anyway. If you don't need to hold the microphone, it, I, I assure you it's much easier. <laughs> so eventually, when you break these bonds, and that's what you're doing there, writing. You actually make a material which is super, super thin. It's only one atom thick. This is my, my defect there. But anyway, it's, uh, it's the super, the, the, the thinnest material known to man. It's only one atom thick and several, several hundreds, thousands of nanometers in lateral size. When this material is exfoliated, literally is rubbed against the surface, and when we break these bonds and we make it this thin, the properties change. So we write with graphite, in fact, uh, doesn't have any wonderful property. When we make it like this, actually becomes a wonder material. It's uh, the lightest material known to man, is the most transparent material known to man, uh, is the strongest material known to man, is 300 times stronger than steel. And in fact, it's been calculated that if I would produce a clean film out of uh, graphene, uh, I could sustain the weight of an elephant. Um, 
He becomes very, very conductive. He controls his electricity better than copper. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's got wonderful, magical properties um, you can't even think about. Uh, the thing is, it was discovered, as I said, in 2004. Back then, believe it or not, I was a PhD student. Uh, so it's recent, but not that recent. Um, and uh, the way my colleagues produced it at the University of, uh, of Manchester was uh, pretty much similar as writing with a piece on a piece of paper with a pencil. They took some thick graphite and they took scotch tape and they started to exfoliate layer after layer. They mechanically broken the bonds. I did it with uh, putting my force, brutal force. Um, they did it with the scotch tape and their brutal force until they ended up looking at the microscope of what they, they found. And they found this ultra thin material, which they called graphene. Now, that was a wonderful discovery because uh, this material was uh, thought to be unstable under normal conditions, in the normal temperature, normal pressure. Uh, that was a wonderful discovery. And, uh, and since then, there was a lot of, uh, of uh, interest. Now, you can understand that, yes, it conduces electricity wonderfully, uh, it's got wonderful properties, thermal properties, um, it's strong, it's mechanically stable, yet I would have found it very, very hard to go to uh, an industrial company like, I don't know, someone who wants to do microchips with it, like Intel or someone else, IBM, and say, employ billions of, of minions there and put them there exfoliating a graphene layer after layer and do your transistors. So I, I found that to be rather impractical and economically not doable. Uh, so as a PhD student, that's what you try to do. You, tr you try to think out of the box. Um, and we did this with, uh, uh, with Jenny Hernandez, who is also a very creative scientist. And in fact, uh, what we came up with, it was a, a method to produce billions and billions and billions of, uh, of uh, graphene flakes uh, using normal liquids. And uh, it, was, um, it was a cheap, very cheap way of producing this material in, a plenty, uh, in plenty of, of quantities uh, and in very, very short time. So um, what's, the, what's the trick there? Well, you need to know a little bit of, uh, it's true, it's kitchen chemistry, you can do it in your kitchen, but you really need to know what you're doing there. And the trick uh, actually was to find the right liquids. Liquids do contain molecules, okay? They're held together by molecules. And these molecules usually have um, uh, strong bonds, in fact. It's like holding hands, okay? The molecules in a liquid hold hands with each other. And usually that's because they like each other, they're similar. Graphite, it's exactly the same thing if I put together the bonds again. Uh, these planes of carbon atoms would like each other very, very much, so they tend to stick together. However, if we find a liquid which is very affine to, to the carbon atoms, which likes the carbon atoms very much, what is happening is this liquid get in getting trapped between these layers, and then eventually, if you agitate uh, this, uh, uh, this dispersion a little bit, provide a little bit of energy, then these layers will come apart. You will break the bonds that I broke with my uh, brutal force. And what you will end up with is uh, uh, billions and billions of these graphene flakes, these things floating around in a, in a liquid. Okay? So I'll show you how easy it is. In fact, you can provide this energy to shake things around in very many ways. Initially, for you know, if you want to talk to chemists and you say you know something professional, well, I'm going to use sonochemistry. I'm going to use ultrasounds, and then other ones will tell you, oh, I'm going to use microwaves, and uh, you can do that, of course. Uh, however, you can also do it in your kitchen with a normal blender. And that's what my, <laughs> my assistant, who is also my PhD student, the poor thing has to cope with this every day. So, <laughs> so it's going to show you how you can, in fact, provide enough energy to break these bonds and make graphene out of uh, uh, cheap graphite. So there you go. Go ahead, Joao. So this, um, these are simple... Uh, 
graphite flakes is like breaking one of those pencils and literally crushing up what, uh, what you get in there, the lead of the pencil. We buy it extremely cheap. We buy 2.5 kilos buckets for something like 20 euro, including VAT. So it's very, very cheap. <laughs> for a scientist, it's important. <laughs> so what you want to do then, you pour your, uh, your magical uh, solvent, if you want to uh, explain that well, that's enough to all, I'd say. <laughs> so, and it's going to show you basically that you can provide this energy, uh, just enough energy to uh, break these uh, um, this bonds. So, that's it. Do not try it at home, please. That's, that's important to say. And there you go. That's what turns... Uh, a chef into a scientist. Uh, thank you very much. Well, for practical reasons, we're going to pass around what a graphic solution looks like. There you go, pass it around. <laughs> thank you. So we didn't, um, we don't go ahead with the, with the process. However, it's working quite well. Uh, but we have the demonstration one. And you can also pass the graphite if you have it. Perfect. So um, we went a step further, in fact. And, uh, well, in actual fact, you, can, um, you, you have a selection of different liquids you can use. And that has allowed to start using this material for many different types of applications. Because uh, if I want to mix my graphene with plastics, some plastics would like, um, um, to, like some, some particular liquids rather than others. So that gives us flexibility. And... Um, um, so we, we have a very, very versatile method. We have l several different liquids. Also, um, we didn't stop there because um, as, a, as a scientist, I thought, well, in actual fact, graphite is not the only layered material in nature. Uh, of course, it's, it's the, 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 the most plentiful, perhaps, is the cheapest one, but it's not the only one. Uh, in fact, it's what I call uh, the zoo of layered materials and la layered crystals. Uh, there are, I counted them, I had to write an article and had to count how many different layered materials there are in nature and there are about 550 different types. And the nice thing is that if you change the different atoms, their different arrangements uh, of, of in these materials, then the properties will change. So some of them will be more brittle but more conductive. Some of them would be, um, would be um, transmitting light better than others. Some of them would be mechanically more robust than others. Uh, so you can start picking and choosing uh, the, uh, the type of, uh, of material that you want to exfoliate in order to, um, to make the application that you like. It's like in the lab, we're starting to play Legos, but with nanomaterials and with the uh, um, thinnest materials known to man. So we have a zoo of materials we are exfoliating in liquid and uh, we can start stacking them on top of each other depending on which type of application we want to pursue. You can also do that in liquid and uh, um, you can, um, as I said before, you have so many different solvents you can work with, you can start being creative and uh, you can uh, perhaps pass me that pint of, uh, of Guinness there. I'm very thirsty. <laughs> no, it's just to show you that we can reproduce with nanomaterials what we did, what Guinness uh, made here. And in fact, I need again my loyal assistant <laughs> to show you another trick, what again you could, to, could do in your kitchen. I showed you before how you can make graphene with a kitchen blender. You can do the same, but with other uh, materials in the zoo. And, um, Another very nice material that is uh, one of the women's best friends, not diamond, um, is uh, it's what we call boronitride. You haven't heard about it, for example, uh, I'm sure, but you, all the women will use it though every day because it's actually used uh, in cosmetics. It's used to make um, all, the, 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 all, the, all the products that relate with cosmetics, they are actually made out of boronitride. And uh, you can start exfoliating this, uh, this material exactly the same way as you do with, uh, with graphene. And then you can be creative in your kitchen. Don't do it at home. And uh, <laughs> you can do something like what Joao is doing. He's doing it near the, the window just to, um, to reproduce a fume hood. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, you've got to work with what you have so far. So that's what it's doing. And we need to give it a little bit of time for the Guinness, the homemade Guinness to settle. And eventually we will pretty much reproduce what the uh, pint of Guinness is like. In fact, um, this separation between the graphite, the graphene and the, and the boron nitride happens because we have used uh, two different liquids which have two different densities, like water and oil, for example. We used, uh, that's why they don't mix. They have two different densities and one will come at the surface and one will go down. Uh, we need to give it a little bit of time to, uh, to mix. You can bring it over here, Joao. <laughs> so what you can do is, um, is using exfoliating graphene, using a, a solvent that is called... Um, loads of foam, sorry. <laughs> loads of foam, it has to settle. So you can put it here, it's fine. For a few minutes, it's fine. So uh, you can exfoliate your, your graphene in a solvent that we call normal methylpyrrolidone. It's a very bad word, just call it NMP. And, uh, and uh, boron nitride in isopropanol, isopropyl alcohol. So that's what you could do and you could be um, inventive in your kitchen. So um, this is pretty much to tell you what you could do, but the, the bottom up, the, the bottom reality is that what we're using this for. We're using these materials for pushing novel technologies. And I'll give you some examples. Uh, Joao, for example, is working on using these uh, two-dimensional materials for uh, uh, energy storage devices, batteries. And uh, all of you will go to him at the end, like, oh, my laptop dies every two, every two minutes. I need to plug it every, t every two seconds. And that's true. You buy a laptop, you buy an appliance, you buy anything that has a battery in it. It will last five hours when you buy. After a year and a half, it will last five minutes without plugging it. Um, and we're trying to solve this issue by using um, ultra-thin materials, which are very, very resistant and conduce electricity very, very well. Another thing we're using these layered materials, for example, boron nitride, is uh, for making, uh, a, well, for storing beer, real beer this time, uh, in plastic bottles. Uh, one, uh, uh, one very more important brand of, of beer, Sub Miller, came to us and said, oh, I heard, I, I read on the newspaper what you can do with these layered materials, with these ultra-thin materials. Is any of this good for, um, for actually starting to uh, selling beer in plastic bottles? Because uh, he explained us um, that, it, that the shelf life of beer in plastic bottles is much, much shorter than what you think. Uh, if they try to sell a beer in a, in a plastic bottle, the gas will actually diffuse out very, very quickly. Within a week, the fizziness of the, of the drink will be gone. And that is a market they can't have. So what we're doing is we're, we're using our, um, our friend boron nitride, the white uh, foam that we created there, um, to make a gas barrier um, to avoid uh, the, the, the fizziness, to avoid the gases, to diffuse out of the plastic bottles and eventually allow beer to be sold in plastic bottles. So these are two very, very different types of application. Of course, you can think about uh, the flat screen technology, the possibility that using these materials um, in 10 years time, you will have a flexible phone which you can wrap up and put it in your pocket uh, and things like this. So um, we're all, watch this space, um, you will hear again about this, this thinnest materials known to man. Um, watch this space, it's actually very cool. Let me see if anybody has any questions. Are you not gonna drink that? <laughs> <laughs> you can try it. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome to apparently. Guest first. Guest first. <laughs> Has anybody got any real questions? <laughs> oh, there's bound to be so dead. Eva, for you again. Go for it. Um, so when you're talking about these uh, beer bottles that have boron nitride in them, like I think when we're talking about that point of graphene and boron nitride there, if you don't actually want to drink them, it's probably not that good for you. So is there any sort of risk or danger in putting beer into plastic bottles that have boron nitride in them? Or yeah, the kind of the, the gist of the question in case you're at the back is, is there a risk in putting 
wonderful, wonderful beer into uh, bottles that uh, have uh, two-dimensional materials within them? Well, the plastic bottle already has, you know, some plastic, which is not very wonderful anyway. That's in the first place. And second, we're already using boronitrate, for example, for our skin. I mean, we put makeup on and that's the same material. I wouldn't recommend you to drink your, your makeup either. So it's pretty much the same thing. You know, of course, drinking is, is, it is, is not the same thing, but it's, it's, uh, it's safe enough to, um, to actually use it for some application more than others. Uh, there is a lot of research going on around um, testing the toxicology of these materials. So there is an old field um, looking into that. Uh, of all the materials in the zoo, uh, there are a handful of materials which have already been tested in, but without exfoliation happening. Uh, and boronitride is one of the, uh, the innocuous ones. Anybody else? Uh, uh, two questions at once, both, both of you. You had your hand up for a microsecond first. Go for it. Yeah, yeah. No, no, you. Yeah, yeah. That was your hand up, wasn't it? Okay, yeah, just checking. Cool. So if you had, like, one layer of graphene, would gases be able to pass through it? Or would it be easy? Yeah, can, can gas pass through a single layer of graphene? Well, it depends. It depends uh, which gas. Uh, some of them, that would, would uh, actually start acting as a membrane, in fact. Some of them would be able to pass and some of them wouldn't. And the idea is to actually uh, match edge to edge uh, different uh, nano sheets like this in order to block some gases and allow some other ones to pass. And you, sir, you're next. Uh, my point is, can you just use it to make some kind of uh, thinner glass that is uh, it's, it's not as heavy as this normal glass? Yeah, thinner glass. So, well, there is, uh, there is a lot of research going into putting this into uh, some particular composite, what we call composite material. So mixing this with other, some glass, but to, to reduce the amount of glass you would use to make it as strong, for example, or with, uh, with plastics as well. So you always, you know, it's ultra thin, you always need uh, a, a matrix to, to embed this within. Um, but you don't need to use very, very much. And the idea is that if you, the matrix is transparent, then adding on graphene or any other material in the zoo, uh, if it is as thin, it would still be transparent. But adding these properties on top. Yeah, could you use that for the whole frame of a car? That's a question. Or a plane, or... Indeed, indeed. The, the idea is, is that, to make uh, ultra-strong materials, but ultra-light as well. Um, so you, you watch this space, there's a lot going on, and um, yeah, there is a lot of surprises in the drawer. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Ah, now they come out. How, how do you see the materials? How do you see the materials? Good question. Very, very carefully? I love this, uh, <laughs> this question. Um, with very, very uh, powerful microscopes. Microscopes, um, you know, you, you have the, 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 the normal vision of a scientist and an optical microscope there in the lab. Well, the microscopes you need to see something as thin uh, are actually huge and do not use light as such, but use one particular source, which, is, which are electrons. So if you use electrons to, um, to go through this material, then you will start seeing it and you will be start seeing the structure of, of this material. So you need very, very powerful microscopes, uh, not the normal ones you actually picture a scientist using, a uh, little bit bigger. And you, sir? Yeah, when you're patenting materials like this, you're patenting the materials or the process? You patent the process. 
uh, because um, what you find out is that if you process it in different liquids, for example, or if you process it in uh, different um, environments, the properties will change as well. So what you patent is the way of making material. And in fact, the, uh, the patent that we, um, we, we filed for producing this material do, for, with this method, not the scotch tape, no other methods, uh, has been patented and has been bought by a company based in the UK who is actually selling these bottles as you, you is, they're passing through, they're, they are circulating at the moment. Uh, the company is called Thomas Swan. So it's actually, you start seeing um, how something that you make in the lab as a PhD student can actually become a real product um, if you patent uh, the, the, the actual discovery. I'm going to ask a question just before anybody else has anyone. I saw, I saw a Horizon documentary some time ago about Andre Guyman about the beginning of graphene and all this. Is it not just the coolest thing in the world to see cutting edge 21st uh, century science being done by a scientist with a roll of sellotape? Is that just not the most amazing thing imaginable? The answer is, of course, it's, yeah. Back then, actually, I was, uh, I was a lecturer at the University of Oxford and I had a group meeting with my students and the next thing I actually bought some pencils and scotch tape and said, how come so that I pay thousands and thousands of pounds <laughs> for, for chemicals and you don't give me the Nobel Prize? But that was amazing. It was a great discovery. <laughs> Anybody else? I'm scanning, I'm scanning. Here. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. That's a really bad idea. You In case you didn't hear that at the back, um, this lady here opened some of the uh, some of some of the white stuff, and some of it fell on her finger, and now her finger is incredibly smooth. Are you, do you want to know where you can buy some in the shops, or what's the? Is that why it's used in cosmetics? Is the question? Um, pretty much. <laughs> what you were doing, brilliant scientist there, because what you were doing it by touching your skin like this, you were exfoliating sheets as you go. So you actually have now a very ultra thin layer of um, exfoliated boronitride. <laughs> well done. <laughs> if you want a PhD, just... <laughs> Please put your hands together for Professor Valeria Nicolosi. We're going to take another final uh, ten minute break and then we have some live improv comedy for you to finish off our evening. Thank you.